recording. Okay, I um, want to say welcome to everybody once again. And uh, thank you for coming back despite my uh, loss of <laughs> situational awareness of where I was administratively with everything um, here. So I, I know I still have some catching up to do. And we, uh, it's been a, a crazy couple of weeks for me and just activities back to back, but that's okay. Um, so we, this week are, I'm going to share my screen and we're at, um, module seven and I see it. Lots of green there now and where we're at, you know, it's hard to believe that, you know, we're at the second to last uh, module in the program here and um, covered quite a bit of material. We still have a little bit more to go. Um, tonight's focus will be on ignition resistant vegetation. We called it initially firewise vegetation, <clears throat> but that's, I guess, the new core kids term is the uh, ignition resistant vegetation. That, and that's a couple of years ago. So it may be even different now again, <laughs> who knows? Um, but we're gonna uh, play a recording once again. We've tried to get the speaker back on, but she hasn't um, been able to, to join us here. So what we're gonna do is play the recording that we had from last year. And we'll once again, take your, your questions for what uh, you have on this. And we'll try to answer them the best that uh, I can with that. Um, here, but I forgot something that I need to share with you guys. So let me come out of the share first so you can see it in full screen. Yeah, but uh, I mentioned last week when we were, or two weeks ago, that last week, Lisa would not be able to join us during the, the home assessments exercise because she was at the uh, Colorado wildfire uh, wildland fire conference. It's a state level conference and uh, it's partially sponsored. Keep me straight on this one, Lisa, by, or maybe mostly so, uh, sponsored and supported by Fire Adapted Colorado. A lot of um, professional organizations and state organizations and um, nonprofits show up at this. So it's really the most I'd say concise or grouping of folks related to wildland fire throughout the state. And in some instances, they bring folks from outside the country. And uh, initially, we were going to miss one of the events, and they said, you really, really should be there. And uh, so Lisa went to it and represented it. And she also did a presentation, by the way, in front of a lot of people. Um, on her book and um, the neighborhood perspective related to that. So Lisa has gone from, you know, just your average everyday citizen, you know, interested in helping people to now this published author and acknowledged, uh, I would say, major player in the wildfire movement here. And uh, it's um, what we've done here and what she's done literally, literally, <laughs> um, is um, being acknowledged in the community and there's great growing interest in it. And during one of the sessions there, the Fire Adapted Colorado uh, recognized our little small group with uh, a really nice award. And I wanted to show it to you here on the screen here, but it's this uh, training award, the award that came from their organization. And it's um, it's just a, a, a great another acknowledgement that what we're doing is on the right track. And that little award came with a nice um, letter to us here about um, the work that we've done. And we've been not doing this for the the recognition, but really what the recognition gives us is validation that we're on the right track. And then people are asking, well, what are you doing with the program and how is it benefiting people? And they wanna bring it to their area 
is the the thing that we discovered is that the there's plenty of information out there, but it's really about walking the journey with you guys from the start all the way, you know, through a point where you can go uh, and start applying this yourselves. And really, there there really isn't um, many programs, if any, that we know of that really do it to this extent. So I think that's the the thing, the lesson learned for us is that when the professionals are asking us, how are we implementing this, then we should take notice and just keep plugging and keep doing what we're doing. So uh, really proud of the acknowledgement that we got from uh, from FACO and they're another partner for us here as we go forward. We, <laughs> we took their program mm -hmm. and we basically brought it to life and uh, we're implementing it. So we, we recognize a lot of similarities in what we are doing. So we're now wanting to uh, continue doing that and uh, seeing how we can replicate this going forward. So is Lisa, was there anything you'd like to say? Uh, anything more on your experience from last week? It was, it was actually, I mean, despite how, despite how there was so many people to be around, I had such fun meeting new people and they kept coming up and asking us about this training program that we're doing that you guys are in. So you guys watch out. You might have to help us teach it. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other? Oh, I, I actually wanted to reflect on last week's um, Firewise uh, assessments exercise. I'll say thanks once again to Heather and to Elizabeth for allowing us to use their properties here. And I think it's always good, uh, a good practical when you can go out and then uh, apply what you learn. And that really is the the difference. And I think uh, understanding what to do, there's so much knowledge out there, but there's always so many different variations of things. And so we were able to see the differences between the two properties and then the different structures and how they're working things. So, and there's that every property we have out here is a journey. You're not going to be able to get everything done um, in a short period of time in some instances, or there are some things that are you're you're at refinement stages here to be able to, to really get closer to fire adapted. But as close as you are, your neighbor may not necessarily be there too. So you may have to make adaptations to your property based on your neighbor's attitude and the amount of work that they need to do too. So um, I think we learned a good bit last week here. And uh, for those of, that were there, uh, is there anything you guys would like to mention about your experience with going through that exercise? I like the um, the fact that you can see on the second house, we can see how much work had been done. And when you look around, there's so much work to be done. But you got to remind yourself, those people have been making some effort for a long time, and it's not cheap or easy. And they may never see the end of it. They may pass it off to some other person that thinks they didn't do anything. <laughs> you know, So yeah. it's just amazing how much work there's to be done. Absolutely. Some people um, inherit more of a problem than others. That's for sure. And you, you don't know it whenever you buy your property. I certainly didn't know it when I bought mine. And so the you can see, you know, you, you just do the best you can with what you have and be smart about the the money that you're spending here. So and let's see, Heather mentioned it's a great time, such good practical application. So that's good. I appreciate that. All right. So uh with that, I'm going to um go ahead and switch back over to the to the video session and then uh, we'll halt it along the way. If you have a, a, a question, you can put it in the chat as we've done before, and um, we'll stop the video if we need to, to, to explain it a little bit more. You know, this one's a little bit longer, and there's, there's some instances that you'll hear repeats of what we said before. So once again, that to me, it's validation of what we're, we're teaching. Oh, you're going to see a couple of red lines on the screen. I'm not sure what happened. We had somebody that was 
had some sort of drawing tool on the screen that uh, I wasn't able to do anything about at the time here. So I apologize for that. And if I could get somebody's confirmation after we start that we can hear the video, then that'll be great. So here we go. All right. Thank you very much, Andre. A pleasure to yep. be here with you all this evening. Yes, yes, and um, I am. I'm sorry, could you say that again? No, we could hear Irene, and now we're back to Irene. Okay, yeah. Okay. All right, here we go. I'm guessing that, you know, with. Um, that you're all here to learn more about ignition resistant landscaping, which I did initially say was firewise landscaping, but um, they are changing the vocabulary and suggesting that we use the term ignition resistant landscaping rather than firewise. So, um, but so I wanted to, you know, kind of set the stage a little bit and just say, um, oops, sorry. Um, that, um, why we care about this and i think actually this is probably i probably don't need to set the stage that much um with this audience but um as many of you know about you know more than half of colorado lives in the wildland urban interface which is a term that probably many of you are familiar with and that's just simply the area where structures and you know other you know human developments meets up with um wildland vegetation so it's at higher risk for uh, wildfires. And, you know, Coloradans love, we love our wild areas, and so more than half of us live in the Wui. And El Paso County actually has a huge amount um, in the Wui. So people may think, oh, well, we don't live in the forest, but, you know, many people um, in El Paso County, so more than a quarter, uh, or nearly a quarter of the population actually lives in the wildland urban interface. And you can see here, in this particular slide, um, just how many people do live in that wildland urban interface or the intermix. And then, you know, the other thing that we do know is that last year was an exceptionally catastrophic wildfire season. We had just unbelievable numbers of fires. There was more than 625,000 acres burned and the three biggest fires ever in history all occurred last year. And unfortunately, this year isn't really looking better. Um, somebody was just mentioning while we were talking in the beginning that this is, you know, not looking like it's going to be a good year, that, that we're predicted to have some pretty serious drought. We're already in drought, and this summer is predicted to be hot and dry, and we may even experience more fires than last year. And the Colorado State Forest Service actually projects a 50 to 200 percent increase in area burned annually by the year 2050. So we are definitely looking more and more at hot and dry and a lot of fires in, um, in our state. And so we do need to think about what we're going to be doing in order to protect our homes. So when we're thinking about protecting our homes, what we really wanna be thinking about is um, the home ignition zone. And that's what I'm gonna be focusing on. And that's sometimes also called, referred to as the safety zone. And so basically within that, there's two factors that determine the chance of a house surviving a fire. And one is structural ignitability. And I'm not gonna be talking about that today, but there's an excellent um, uh, brochure put out by the Colorado State Forest Service on firewise construction. And I highly recommend that if you wanna see what the things that you can do to make your house, like the siding and the soffits and the vents and the roof and you know, those sorts of things, what you can do to make your house um, less prone to burning. I highly recommend that you download that. It's a free uh, brochure that you can just type in, Firewise Construction Site Design and Building Materials from the Colorado State Forest Service. But what I'm gonna be focusing on today is defensible space and firewise landscaping, both of which, you know, the terminology is changing, and, but I'm just gonna go ahead and use um, th those particular terms um, sort of today and, you know, it's one of those continually evolving um, language things. So when you're talking about, um, you know, reducing the risk around your house, what you want to do is, is start thinking about right around your house. And so you want to be thinking about, you know, um, you know, just the various things, or, you know, that you can do. And 
one of the reasons that we want to start right around the house is because of ember storms. So embers, you know, most people, when they think about a wildfire, um, if you've never experienced a wildfire, um, you think about it sort of being like a flash flood in that this wall of flames just comes rushing down and it envelops the house, it envelops everything in the flames, and then it moves on. But that's not how fires mostly work. Fires actually, so most of the houses that burn in a fire um, burn due to embers. And embers can come from a fire a half mile away, they can come from a mile away, sometimes on a really wind-driven event, they can come from as far as two miles away. And these embers fly from the fire and they will ignite the areas right around your house. And so this is why we wanna have our house be made of ignition resistant materials and we want to be really be thinking about you know some of the specific landscaping. So here we have um, you know like a welcome mat caught on fire, and we've got some leaves and other kinds of debris, which we'll talk about in a minute, caught on fire. Here we've got um, leaves and other debris in the gutter, catching the house on fire. Um, and so you just see that all it took was embers. There's you know that doesn't have to be any crown fire anywhere near your house for your house to burn down in a wildfire. And so it's really what we have to be doing is be thinking about being ember aware. So one of the uh, number one things that we have to think about doing is um, cleaning out the gutters in our house on a yearly basis. So that's just something that you have to be doing. Clean any debris, any branches, anything off the roof, and then also rake up any pine needles and leaves that are gonna be collecting near your house. So for example, here's some, you know, like, so think about, um, you know, in the springtime when you go out around your house, the winds will have, you know, carried little currents of, of pine needles and, um, and leaves and other things right near the edges of your house. And those leaves and pine needles are the perfect tinder in order for the embers to land in and to catch your house on fire. And it's all snugged up right against your house. And so then you have this beautiful little tinder patch and then that is right next to your house and that can actually catch your entire house on fire. And so you wanna be thinking about those. And so you really have to be thinking about the embers catching your house on fire versus again, that wall of flame. And so one of the very best things, this is actually probably the number one recommendation that I can make is to, act, to create a three to five foot um, non-flammable vegetation free perimeter around all the sides of your structure. So this needs to be kept clear, but if you have this, then, and this is, you know, rake out the needles and the leaves and the ember storm comes, there's not gonna be anything for them to catch on. And so they're just gonna kind of fall on the ground and burn themselves out. And they're not gonna catch your whole house on fire versus when the ember storms come and there's a whole bunch of leaves and needles, or, um, you know, there's uh, a bunch of flammable material here, then that can catch your entire house on fire. So this is probably the number one thing you can do to protect your house is just that three to five foot non-flammable uh, perimeter. But also don't, don't just think about the house, really think about the stair to ground junctions. So you've got to have, you know, so um, here's a picture of a house that, um, you know, the house itself was okay, but the uh, stairway was wooden and there was material, there was vegetation that was going all the way up to the stairway and there's probably some leaves and needles here. And so the stairway caught on fire and then came up and was going to burn the house down. This particular house had a firefighter there to save it. Um, so only the front porch burned. But if you didn't have a firefighter there to save your house, which in all likelihood, um, when we have fires in Colorado, they tend to be very fast moving and the likelihood of actually having a firefighter at your house is very slim. So you have to think about your house standing on its own. So you wanna make sure that you've got something so that non, you know, that three to five foot non-flammable perimeter has to extend to the stairways and under the decks of your house. And so, um, so think about that as well. And then the other thing is don't store anything combustible on or under your decks. Now it's so convenient in the winter time if you've got a wood burning stove to have that firewood right outside your deck and maybe you wanna have it for, you know, some little ambiance or a little fire pit. Um, but you know, this particular house, if you look at it, we have some live trees here in the background. 
And obviously there was not a crown fire that engulfed this house, but we did have embers coming from the distant fire. I mean, I'm not exactly sure how far away the fire was. And it landed on the firewood in this deck and it started to catch on fire. And you can see that this um, porch was starting to burn. And um, a firefighter did get there and was able to um, throw away all of the, the, the firewood that was um, on fire and also uh, put out the fire here. So if there hadn't been a firefighter there, this firewood on the deck would have caught the house on fire. The same could be said for if you have um, patio furniture with you know, nice fluffy pillows or anything like that, you wanna make sure that you do not have anything combustible on a deck. And then also think about your fences because a wood fence actually acts like a fuse. So here's another house and we've got some, um, we have a few burned trees here, but we still have some green trees around here. And what happened here was that the embers landed on the grass fire, the grass, uh, uh, landed on the grass, and the grass caught on fire, came up to the fence, caught the fence on fire, and the fence was starting to burn. You can see here in this picture, this part of the fence burned, and it was heading towards the house because of um, the wooden fence being caught on fire. And so again, a firefighter here was here to save it, opened up the, the gate of the fence to stop that fuse, and allowed the house to not catch on fire. But again, if there hadn't been a firefighter there, this would have just caught on fire, caught the house on fire. And so then, um, and, and you know, so that wooden fence really um, is a dangerous thing. A simple remedy for that would be to just put a gate right next to the house. So here we have a gate here, which is not, you know, not where we'd want to have it. You'd want to have a gate that would be going, extending this entire distance, or at least right here, a metal non-flammable gate in order to um, to keep the, the fuse, from, the, I'm sorry, the fence from acting like a fuse. So um, when we're talking about, you know, so now we're going to kind of move out into the um, areas, the zones of the defensible space. And again, <laughs> the term defensible space um, is, you know, used in some some areas and in some areas it's like the zone of risk reduction but you know you can call it what you want what you're doing is you're trying to reduce the risk of your house catching on fire and so we're mostly going to be talking today in this talk about that zone one which extends from that from your house out to 30 feet so um so zone one is um occurs in you know so it's again within 30 feet of all structures and in zone one, what you want to be doing is removing all conifers, all gamble oak, and any other shrubs 30 feet away from the house. Now, some places in El Paso County, they actually say you can have 15 feet, but the Colorado State Forest Service standards do say that you should go all the way out to 30 feet. And that would be the safer thing. So you don't, I would not go with the minimum requirements. I would go with, you know, sort of the standard, more um, conservative requirements. If you do live high enough to have some aspen um, or high moisture shrubs, those can be okay within 15 feet as long as they're not continuous. And another thing is that a lot of people have a lot of resistance to cutting down all of the ponderosas or all of, you know, they have some prized trees that are near their house. And it may be a tree that, you know, blocks the sun when you're sitting out there in the evening, or maybe all the birds come to that tree, or it's a tree that's just so beautiful that you actually kind of built your house around it. And so you can keep some of those prized trees within that 30 feet, but then you have to now act like that's part of your defensible space. And so you kind of isolate it. So make sure that there aren't other trees within 30 feet. So it's kind of got its own little defensible space. And then you also want to make sure that you prune all the branches um, to at least 10 feet tall and then remove all ladder fuels, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, underneath it. And then also, if it's you know, relatively close to your house, just make sure that the no branches are overhanging the roof or are within about 10 feet of the chimney because that can keep, um, you know, you, what you really wouldn't want to do is have, um, you know, have a fire in your, in your um, stove or, you know, in your fireplace and then have the embers from that fire catch your prize tree on fire, which would not only catch your prize tree on fire, but then also may potentially burn down your house. And so make sure that your prize tree isn't part of the problem. 
And so I did mention ladder fuels. So ladder fuels are just simply fuels that are, you know, on the ground that can then, um, you know, so you can get grass catching on a, some little um, flammable um, perennial, which is, you know, gets another small, a little bit bigger shrub and goes up and then it will catch into the lower branches of a tree and then the tree will catch on fire. And then if the trees are close together, you get a crown fire, which is much harder to stop. And so what you really don't want to do is have, you know, trees get into a crown fire. You want to keep as much as possible the fuels lower on the ground because those are easier to deal with from a firefighter's perspective. And so you just want to make sure that you remove all ladder fuels um, from the base of a tree. And, you know, ground junipers, which um, many people have, are um, one of the most extreme versions of ladder fuels because they're extremely flammable. They have a lot of um, volatile oils in them, and they are, you know, probably more flammable than even a pine tree or a gamble oak. And so you want to make sure that absolutely you don't have any um, of the ground junipers anywhere, you know, <clears throat> around, especially a prize tree, but also anywhere in that first 30 feet of your property. Another thing you want to do is to rake up, again, this is within that first 30 feet, is rake up, you know, the pine needles and leaves that are kind of um, just carpeting the ground, because again, you don't want the embers to be falling on those needles and leaves and then kind of running, because if you had a continuous carpet of dried pine needles, that would act, you know, basically like a grass fire and it could run all the way up to your house. And so you want to make sure that this is not something that is contributing to any fire, any embers that will land and catch these uh, pine needles and leaves on fire. Any questions? <clears throat> um, nothing so far. In the chat. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then moving on. So now I want to sort of talk about, so this is, that was sort of the tough love talk portion of the talk. And, you know, I was in Gilpin County for many years. I lived in Gilpin County for, for 20 years, and that's all about 9,000 feet. The entire county was in the wildland urban interface. And I spent a lot of time working with people about their defensible spaces and, you know, trying to convince people to work on, on defensible spaces. And I met with a lot of resistance. And uh, one of the biggest reasons for the resistance was that um, people just said, you know, I moved up here for the nature, I moved here for the trees, I love this all, and I don't want to cut things down. And it's going to be a moonscape, it's going to be terrible, I can't stand the thought of this. And, you know, and I can, I can understand that perspective. And so, in fact, here's a kind of a more extreme case in point. So I found this um, article in, the, in April 2013, it was a Boulder Home and Garden magazine, and it was um, an article featuring this, the house of a man who had lost his house twice in fires. So he w lost them once in the Black Tiger fire and once in the 2010 Four Mile fire. And so he really built an ignition resistant house, which in the house itself is quite, quite attractive, I think. Um, but this is what his landscape looks like. And he says it's devoid of decorative landscaping. And that to me looks like you're living in a perpetual construction zone. It's not the kind of place that most of us want to call home. And it's not the kind of place that makes you just think, yeah, sure, I'll cut down my trees and live in a place like that. That's not how most of us want to live. And I get that. So let's talk about how to make defensible space be a place that you actually want to be because there are so many ways that you can do it. So first of all, let's talk about that using that three to five foot perimeter to be a functional walking space. So if you actually you know, created, especially if it's five feet wide and you have it right around your house, that can be the place that you have to walk around your house. We all need to walk around our house. So make, you know, rather than having what is typical, which is having the walkway be a little bit out from the house and then have some plants near the house, just put that walkway right by the house and then have the plants on the other side. And boom, there you have your, um, your three to five foot non-combustible perimeter and it's functional. And you can make it attractive. So it doesn't have to be an ugly you know, pathway. It can actually be quite attractive and people have done all sorts of creative things with bricks and flagstones and other kinds of things that make you think, yes, I like this, this looks good. 
And then you can expand some of that, you know, in some areas where if you have a nice flat spot, you can actually expand that, um, that non combustible perimeter out to become a patio or a you know, non wood deck to actually have a place where you can sit in the evening, have your dinner, have coffee in the morning, have a glass of wine in the evening. And so you can expand that to be, you know, a place that you really want to sit um, and enjoy. And if you don't have a flat space, which a lot of us don't, um, you can use, uh, you know, you can have a, a metal deck or you can use, um, you know, a deck that is made with, uh, you know, some of the plastic timber. The one thing I do want to say about plastic timber is to make sure that you, uh, it does have a fire retardant built into it. So it has to be treated with a fire retardant because if it is not treated with a fire retardant, it, it actually can be more flammable than, in, um, than a wood deck. So think about, um, you know, so just check and make sure that it has been re, uh, treated with a fire retardant. But decks can, you know, so that can be a great way to um, have that, you know, functional walkway and the functional outdoor space, even if you have a, a slope. So here's just another picture of a very pleasant space that you can enjoy um, your flowers just a little bit away from the house. So another concern that I often heard was, you know, that if I take away um, the plants, my foundation is ugly or it just looks bare. And we are very conditioned to having plants right at the, you know, at the base of our house. And in fact, that's where the whole term foundation planting comes from. And junipers are the classic foundation planting plant. And so you'll see all kinds of plants or all kinds of houses with using junipers as a foundation plant, you know, and they were used that way because they're evergreen and they're dense and they hide a lot of the um, sins of a foundation. But of course, now we know that junipers would be the absolute worst plant to have as your foundation planting because they are so flammable. So we want to not have um, foundation plants. We want to kind of think outside the box and think how can we have um, how, what can we do with our foundation and not have it, uh, not feel like we have to hide it with junipers? So one, um, one option is to, you know, put a stone veneer on that. So I just found this, you know, this was a, an ad for a product where, you know, here's your before um, stone foundation or your, you know, concrete foundation. And then you can just put a little stone veneer on it to make it more attractive. Or here's an example of a house that's being purpose built with a um, you know a stone veneer on the foundation, which is nice and flat and and um, ignition resistant. And here's a house where I really liked this um, concept, where they put um, kind of a corrugated steel that allowed it to rust. And I thought that that made a very attractive um, you know foundation. And you know here we have um, some good you know um, non combustible space. Now they did put in some grass, which I would not recommend. But aside from the grass, this is a really excellent um, example of a, um, you know, just an attractive and, you know, a, a foundation that, that you actually, or at least I think, in my opinion, it's a very attractive foundation that, you know, you might want to have. Another thing, so let's just say you don't have a foundation um, that works with any of those kinds of solutions. And so another thing that you could consider doing is add some, you know, large rocks or boulders to sort of soften that transition from the wall to the ground. And so you kind of think about it as like a large rock garden that is right um, next to the wall of your house. And you can plant some, you know, widely spaced plants that have a high water content in between those rocks. And so you can have like, you know, you don't want to have the, those plants right up there against the um, foundation of your house but you can have a little further out. And so this can be a way to really draw the eye um, into that, uh, in, into the plantings versus the area right at the edge of your house. So some plant suggestions, and these are in the handout that um, I think Lisa put, um, uh, so you should be able to see, download this. And also, I don't know if uh, it was sent out, but that can be sent out to you all later. And so I'm just gonna kind of blow through a few of these suggestions, but so some ideas that you could put, again, widely spaced um, in that first three to five feet. Ideally, again, you're not gonna plant anything at all, but I get that maybe that's a little bit too much for some people. 
And so if you do want to plant something, you know, plant some of these because they are, you know, very ignition resistant. So things like a juga or basket of gold, creeping phlox, creeping thyme, giant flowered soapwort, met penstemon, hardy plumbago, hens and chicks, lamb's ears, lily of the valley, which is good for shady spots, um, ice plant, poppy mallow, pussy toes, uh, rock soapwort, which is in this picture, rock crest, snow in summer, veronicas, and sedum. So those would be all options. I would not plant as densely as this particular picture. And I only took this, I put this in here because, you know, it's just a nice picture of the rock soapwort. So again, I'd go a little bit back more to um, what you'd see here where it's more rocks and fewer plants. Okay, so um, actually let me stop here and see if there are any questions. Yes, yeah, sorry, we have a, a few questions. And okay. maybe you, you answered some of these already. Uh, the first is a, a, a request and it says, please talk about alternatives to bark mulch that are fire resistant, but not stone or rocks and what plants can we grow in the five foot home ignition zone and how can we keep them from having to be watered very much? And in parentheses, she has a water box. Yeah, so most of these plants here uh, in this, so the mulch question I'll get to in a minute. Um, so I'll, I'll hold that question, but then, you know, so you know, again, here's some of the ones that you can plant in that first th three to five feet. Most of the ones in, on this particular list are also very um, water, um, they're water wise. And so they won't take much in the way of water, but I do have some tips for watering also um, in just a little bit. So, and so would you include the plants on that list as, um, uh, ignition resistant native plants? Not all of those five? particular, so some of, a lot of the ones right, you know, there's only a few in this particular list, this first three to five, I'm going to go a lot more into natives, uh, in the second section. Um, so there's only, a, so with that first three to five feet, again, we're looking for highly, um, short plants that are have a lot of moisture content. And we don't have very many native plants that fit that bill. We do have a few in here that are native, um, including, well, there are some creeping flocks that are native, um, mat penstemons, um, the poppy mallow, also known as wine cups, pussy toes. Um, those are all native plants that would fit that bill. Um, but I'm going to talk about more native plants for a little bit further out. But the reason that there's a lot of non-native plants in that first three, three to five feet is just because Colorado doesn't specialize in very short, you know, we just don't have a lot of sort of ground covery, short, high water content plants. And um, as I mentioned to you in, uh, uh, just before we started, when we were talking about native plants, I think you're referencing Colorado and the person that asked that question is the person from Oregon. So would there be any differences okay, yeah, that you and, understand for Oregon? Yeah, and all I think those, I mean, I'm not as familiar with the native plants from Oregon, but all those, the plant, the natives, you know, so all these plants I think would work in Oregon. And I think at least, well, to be honest, I'm not sure what, which ones of these would be um, native in Oregon, but you know, this list of plants, I believe would work in Oregon as well. Uh, Cherise, you, you mentioned that she didn't address the bark mulch issue, but I think you're gonna come to that in the yes, I'm gonna come part to of the presentation. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, there's an, another question um, from uh, Craig Stewart here. We have, how high should smaller trees be limbed up without harming the tree? So you don't want to go more than a third of the way up. So, um, you know, so just be 10 feet or the bottom third, whichever is soonest. So, so you want to stop, you know, so you, you'd want to stop no more than a third of the way up. If that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Ed and this relates to your plant list once again. Now, please state which plants have two qualities. Uh, one, <clears throat> which ones will grow in sandy soil, and then which ones will 
um, stabilized loose soil? Um, so in, in this, and we're going to go into more plant lists. So this is not the end of the plant list question. So, um, but you know, in general things, I would say that pretty much all the plants that I've talked about that are on this slide list right here would grow in fairly sandy soil. And all of them, I mean, pretty much any plant that grows in a sandy soil does help to stabilize the soil. These, because they're ground covers, do help, um, you know, just so they tend to have, you know, rooting as they go out, they're more mat forming. They tend to do a, a good job with um, stabilizing the soil. Okay, thank you. And the uh, a request from Becky Zitterich, can you talk about fire resistant and fire tolerant plants and the role they should play, aka blue grammar. I hope I said that word right. So, fire resistant plants don't tend to get, um, they don't just, they tend not to ignite, you know, just because they have a higher moisture content and they don't have a lot of, um, and actually, why don't we talk, let's talk about that at the very end. I think that might make a little bit more sense, um, maybe. Um, so, if we could circle back. Becky, would you ask that again if I don't remember to circle back to that? Okay, so uh, two hold offs here and uh, we'll track those also. Okay. All right, that's all we have for now. Okay, great. So hopefully I'll get to the bark mulch question in just a little bit. Um, okay, so now we're gonna talk about from five feet out to 30 feet out. So just some general tips for this zone. So again, we talked about that first, you know, three to five feet, which ideally will have no vegetation, but if you have to have a little bit, we talked about what that would work. So from this zone, what we want to use again is ignition resistant plant materials. And so, um, you know, ideally you want them to be relatively short and the closer to the house, the shorter they should be. So, you know, kind of have a gradient. So, you know, anything that first three to five feet should be very short. And then as you go out to the 30 feet, they can get a little bit taller, but you kind of want them to you know, graduate up. You also want to make sure that they're very, uh, have a low sap or resin content. So again, we, we talked about the conifers and um, things like sages that have, you know, a lot of volatile oils in them. You want plants that don't shed or accumulate a lot of dead branches or needles or, you know, any sort of leaves or debris. Um, so you just want to make sure that there, there's nothing dead there that the embers could catch. You want things that can be easily uh, maintained and pruned, and you want to prune back all the perennials in the springtime so that you don't have a lot of that dead, um, easily flammable material above ground when the summer dries out. And then you want them to be drought tolerant. So somebody asked about, you know, the water-wise. And, um, you know, if we chose water-wise native plants, which I'll be talking about in a little bit, um, those are going to be the ones that are you know, naturally won't dry out as much in um, a really, you know, if we have a hot dry summer, which we're predicted to have more and more of, and so they're going to be the ones that aren't going to just sort of crisp up like some of the other, um, you know, instead of some of the other plants that you might have. And then, of course, you want to have a, a diversity of species just because, you know, different species are more susceptible to burning at different times of year, and so you want to not have just a monoculture in your yard. You actually want to have a variety of species. So some plants that you don't want to plant in that first 30 feet are, again, I mentioned the sages because they have volatile oils in them, plus they tend to accumulate a lot of um, dead branches and, and the old flowers tend to be very dried out and, and are easily prone to catching embers. Rosemary has volatile oils, junipers and pines and spruce, and even arborvitae. We talked about you know, those being, um, you don't want to have those conifers um, within that first 30 feet. And you don't want to have any grasses that uh, dry out. So that could be just your regular lawn, but it also could be tall ornamental grasses like a miscanthus or things like that. Um, brooms, which you know are the ornamental brooms that have the yellow flowers in the springtime, those are also quite um, flammable. Japanese honeysuckle is flammable and so is rabbit brush. So put those, if you're going to plant these, plant them out of that, um, away from that first 30 feet. And so then, um, you know, so here's maybe helps to address that first 30 feet, you know, the watering question. So, you know, you do want to keep those plants within that first 30 feet watered. So, again, 
We want to choose uh, drought tolerant plants so they won't need as much water. But ideally, you know, you do, will want to water them. And so if you have water rights, you can use, you know, drip system, you could use sprinklers, whatever. But if you don't have water rights, again, what you want to do is, you know, just have, um, is make use of any natural precipitation that you have. And so, you know, you can direct your downspout into your garden so that those, that will water um, that first 30 feet as much, you know, whenever we actually do get a rain. Um, and, you know, and again, pick, uh, pick plants that don't require a lot of outside irrigation if you don't have water rights or if you have a well that is not a very high producing well, which I certainly did when um, I was, lived in Gilpin County. And so here's to the mulch question. So um, you definitely don't want to use combust combustible mulches like bark or wood chips or even rubber. Um, and so gravel, and I know that whoever asked about that wasn't really looking for gravel as um, an answer, but um, just in case you need a tiny bit of persuasion, the gravel can make is a fantastic mulch to use on native plants because you, you, the native plants don't want a lot of um, organic matter. And so it's actually really a great way to get uh, native plants to reseed and that does help keep in some moisture. Now, if, um, if gravel is still not acceptable for whatever reason, the other option would be to plant plants very closely together so that you actually don't need a mulch. And so they will act like a living mulch. Um, and, you know, and so you can just do away with a mulch altogether. But there really aren't any other, I, I can't say that there's a silver bullet for mulch that would not you know, involve gravel um, as a non-combustible because pretty much that's our only non-combustible um, mulch that you can get. And any other mulch, including rubber, uh, is not acceptable. So if you if you don't want to use gravel, then plant your plants um, closely together. Another thing um, that you should consider doing is to create, you know, think about your whole, your garden as a whole and create fuels breaks within your garden. So you know use pathways. Um, use, you know, again, like if you if you can use a gravel mulch, um, a gravel mulch pathway makes a great fuels break because now, you know, if a fire um, came, caught this grass on fire and was coming up, this pathway would stop the fire cold. Um, you can also use a watered lawn if you have water rights to, um, that makes actually a pretty good um, fuels break. Um, you can also use stone walls or, you know, anything, you know, large patio areas, again, to create little fuels breaks within your garden. So kind of think about it and break it up. Don't have continuous fuels going up towards your house, make sure that there's places where the fire is just going to fizzle out if it does start catching and running up towards your house. And, you know, so, and again, like you might be saying, well, I don't have the flat ground, but you can have a garden um, even on a slope. So again, if you took out the trees here, you could um, terrace the slope and plant a garden, um, you know, or put, you know, so you could either put, um, you know, rocks or, um, and I would particularly recommend rocks versus, you know, ties, just because um, these are wood. Although there's so the um, a railroad tie, you know, especially one that is not treated with creosote or something like that, it's pretty hard to catch that on fire. But if you can do, um, a, a, if you can terrace with a with rocks, that would be recommended. So here's just some examples of that. And then again, in the springtime, make sure you trim back all your perennials just to keep, um, you know, any dry dead materials out. So, you know, cut back those tall grasses. And if you do have a lawn, make sure that it's, you know, it doesn't get taller than four inches, um, which is also actually the height for the most healthy lawn that you can have um, because you don't want it to, you know, be able to carry uh, fuel or carry a fire up to your house. Okay, so let me just st stop and check before. We, so this is gonna be a, a few more plant lists, but I just wanna make sure um, that I address the, the bark or the mulch and water question adequately. Um, I'll ask uh, Cherise, uh, do you have, is that okay with you? Or do you have a follow-on question? Well, 
that's fine. I mean, I, I, I practice those things, but I have a lot of very resistant um, people I advise to who are asking me what to do instead of bark mulch. But the other thing that they are also recommending now in some circles, which I disagree with, is the use of fire retardants on the mulch because from the literature, it leaches out within a few months and it's also toxic to pollinators and the soil microbiota. Yeah, I, I also disagree with using a fire retardant on the mulch. And so I would say gravel mulch or living mulch are pretty much again. And you know, and gravel mulch, if used night well, it can be very attractive, um, you know, so maybe getting some pictures of, um, you know, some some really beautiful native plant gardens with um, gravel mulch might help, or just, you know, some a little bit denser um, gardens with some pathways in between them to kind of break up the fuels of the plant material. Yeah, I, I think those are good ideas. The other problem though with, with uh, the rock mulches is leaf gathering. I mean, the trees and the shrubs are dropping leaves all the time. And when you want to get those leaves off, you're sucking up the gravel, which ruins your equipment. Yeah. Gra gravel size does make a difference. Even though yeah. pea gravel can be very attractive, it's not necessarily appropriate where you have leaf litter coming down. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I would say that I, I, I think um, some of the, especially in that first th three to five feet from the house, um, you know, using something that's more easily swept, like um, uh, flagstone or, you know, I mean, you can even do some like beautiful concrete work um, w that could be um, in that first three to five feet to really make sure that there's no um, leaf and, and needle piles right next to the house. Um, but yeah, and, you know, and, and people do sometimes use uh, leaf blowers, which, you know, again, have their issues, but um, yeah, so I would say like in an ideal world, um, the first, you know, and again, it's tough to get people to, you know, comply on all respects, but yeah, I think that first three to five feet is much easier tended if it is um, a the smoother other, surface. The other thing that I've heard recommended and I do myself is I use compost instead of mulch. It doesn't have that much flammable material in it if it's properly composted. Um, that's what yeah, we Yeah, I mean, here. I would say that that's certainly better than, um, than a bark mulch, um, but I would still say that um, either the gravel mulch or um, just other plants would be a little bit better. Okay, well, the, the, I'm sorry for taking up so much time. This is- That's okay a huge topic where I'm at because a lot of people are very concerned about um, the developed environment. I actually am not in a forested environment, but in a small city environment, mm -hmm. not being eco-friendly because, and also causing, um, by putting out all of these non-organic materials, heating up the atmosphere in the city and around towns. So I'm trying to find alternatives that are not harsh on the soil, still allow microorganisms to do their job, uh, pollinator friendly and um, fire resistant. And finding that balance is a challenge because some people are saying, I won't even come to listen to you because I don't want our location to look like the house that you described or even similar to that. So I'm trying to make compromise things happen. And that's why I'm bugging you on these points. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, and again, I would say in that case, probably, you know, just planting uh, denser plants and then putting some, you know, fuels breaks with pathways in between would okay. might be the, you know, because that, you know, and I'll, and I'll be going into some of the, um, the drought tolerant native perennials that also provide, you know, habitat for pollinators in, um, that's my next little bit. So I think that there is a way uh, to sell it. And I would say that if they are concerned about the heat islands, um, yeah, then the more plants and then you just break it up with some pathways. Okay, thank you.
Uh, we have a, a question from uh, Kristen. Do you have a preference for gravel size, meaning rock size? Um, it kind of depends on what your purpose is. I mean, you can, you can do almost any size that you want. I would say that you're going to get, if you're trying to get your native plants to reseed, um, the more pea gravel size is going to be more effective for that. But, um, and then I guess, you know, the other thing with the larger gravel is that it tends to accumulate a little bit, you know, leaves can accumulate a little bit more um, readily in the larger gravel size. Um, but I would say probably you can go with, you know, I would say, I would say if, if it's a question between gravel versus um, bark mulch, then go with whatever gravel you want. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have two questions from Lucy. The first one is, what, what depth of gravel is needed? I couldn't hear the last word you said. Needed? Oh, what needed, thank you. What depth of gravel yeah. is needed? Needed, okay. Um, so I would say that you don't need a, big, a deep, you know, I would say like an inch and a half would be fine for most, um, you know, for gravel. You could go up to two inches but you don't really need to go beyond that. Okay, our second question is, how do you deal with amending soil, adding new plants, et cetera, if you have to all that loose gravel on top to avoid it being mixed into the underlying soil? So you'd want to amend your soil before you plant. Um, you know, so if you, if you have, you know, so if, if you, I mean, depending on whether you're starting over with a new bed or not, um, amend your soil. The other thing though about native plants is a lot of times you don't need to amend soils because they're used to our very lean Colorado soils. And so unless you're dealing with a kind of new development where the um, soils have been scraped off or um, you know, just really poor compacted soils, you may not need to amend soils if you are kind of sticking with native plants. Um, and even some of the other xeric plants are, you know, pretty good about, you know, not needing a lot of soil amendment. But if you are going to add a new plant and you have a couple inches of gravel, um, you know, just what I do is just kind of dig the gravel away from the new hole that you're putting. Um, and if you need to add a little compost or something like that into, into the hole, that's okay. And then plant it, put the soil back, and then put the gravel back on there. Now, if you're needing to do an entire, you know, like a larger area, I would try to rake the gravel away from the area that you're planting and then deal with that. So I guess it just depends on how large an area you're talking about. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, we have a comment more like uh, Becky, Becky Zitter sharing her technique. Um, she says, I have a large, I have large rock under my deck. However, pine needles accumulate over the top and are almost impossible to rake off that rock without spreading that large rock everywhere. I'm gradually getting down to just native decomposed granite, which is super easy to rake. It doesn't look fancy, but it works really well. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that, that's certainly the, um, it, it, the simplicity factor. And sometimes that's what, trumps everything. So yeah, that, that can be a, a good solution for sure. Okay, uh, we're caught up on questions and comments now. Okay, great. So now I'm just going to talk about a few um, plant choices. Um, and so one of the things I really like to say, you know, do is try to combine, you know, to say if you're, if you're kind of removing some trees and other kinds of things, replace it with, with, um, with plants that are beautiful, but then also provide habitat and also some joy to the gardener. So these are just some um, examples of some plants, um, you know, they're kind of uh, paired, um, you know, just, I would just try not to have too many slides. And so this is just um, some plants, but you know, the pasque flower and golden banner are both spring blooming plants. They're great for early pollinators. Um, the golden banner uh, does grow by rhizomes, and so this could be a good, um, so somebody was asked about stabilizing um, soil, and because it grows by rhizomes, that's a good um, choice for sort of more hillsides. 
and um, you know again both of these are great for early pollinators. Um, the thing about the golden banner is that because it grows by rhizomes if you have a small planting space I don't think I would recommend it because it does tend to take you know it does tend to grow somewhat aggressively. Um, Penstemons are very good for um, fire resistance and um, these two here, the orchid or side bells penstemon and the blue mist penstemon bloom early in the springtime. Um, very good for early uh, solitary and bumblebees. And then later in the season, we have Rocky Mountain penstemon and scarlet bugler penstemon. Um, the Rocky Mountain penstemon is great for both bumblebees and for hummingbirds. And the scarlet bugler penstemon is actually one of the best hummingbird plants that um, I know. Uh, sulfur flower and prairie smoke are both, you know, like a little bit taller. They're still sort of lower growing plants, but they're a little bit taller. Um, the sulfur flower has beautiful yellow flowers in the springtime or early summer, and it's a host plant for a lot of different kinds of butterflies and also will attract a variety of pollinators to the flowers. And then the prairie smoke um, will grow in a part shade situation, or it can also It'll probably be happiest in a part shade situation um, and it attracts um, bumblebees to the sort of those smoky pink flowers. And they can kind of get right up in there and they're entertaining to watch as they. I'm sorry to halt the uh, Emma, Emma ask if I could go back to go back one slide. So I'm going to do that here real quick. Okay. These are great for early pollinators. Um, the thing about the golden banner is that because it grows by rhizomes, if you have a small planting space, I don't think I would recommend it because it does tend to take, you know, it does tend to grow somewhat aggressively. Um, penstemons are very good for um, fire resistance. And um, these two here, the orchid or side bells penstemon and the blue mist penstemon bloom early in the springtime. Um, very good for early uh, solitary and bumblebees. And then later in the season, we have Rocky Mountain penstemon and Scarlet Bugler penstemon. Um, the Rocky Mountain penstemon is great for both bumblebees and for hummingbirds. And the Scarlet Bugler penstemon is actually one of the best hummingbird plants that um, I know. Uh, sulfur flower and prairie smoke are both, you know, like a little bit taller. They're still sort of lower growing plants, but they're a little bit taller. Um, the sulfur flower has beautiful yellow flowers in the springtime or early summer, and it's a host plant for a lot of different kinds of butterflies and also will attract a variety of pollinators to the flowers. And then the prairie smoke um, will grow in a part shade situation, or it can also It'll probably be happiest in a part shade situation um, and it attracts um, bumblebees to the sort of those smoky pink flowers. They can kind of get right up in there and they're entertaining to watch as they pollinate. Uh, silver lupin is um, a little bit more drought tolerant than some of the other lupins like the Russell hybrids um, and it's great for a variety of different kinds of bees and butterflies. And then yarrow um, is another rhizomatously growing plant. It's deer resistant. So this will um, help to stabilize soils. It will grow in you know, very sandy decomposed granite type soils. Ha um, has you know, small flowers, so it'll attract a lot of smaller pollinators, but also um, butter butterflies and bees. Bee balm, as you might guess, um, has, it does attract bees, but it also will attract butterflies and hummingbirds. And it is uh, deer resistant because it's pretty strongly flavored and smelling. And, um, and it looks, it's a beautiful flower in the middle of the summer. And then another summer bloomer is Black Eyed Susan. This is a biennial. It is attractive to a variety of different bees and butterflies. And then later in the season, um, the seed heads are very, very attractive to finches. And so it provides um, several seasons of habitat. Harebells are a very widely adaptable plant. They can go all the way up to timberline, but then come down to uh, lower elevations as well. They look really great in the garden, um, attract small bees. And then uh, blanket flower um, 
also is a good middle of the summer blooming plant that attracts a lot of different butterflies and bees. And I think the combination here is a really good zingy summer combination. So if people are, you know, wanting something, you know, if they're in a more built environment and they're wanting um, a showy look that's not going to look too native, you know, to, um, you know, people who are worried about HOAs or other kinds of things like this, this combination uh, is very, very show-stopping and also provides some good habitat. Showy daisy and columbines um, are also another good sophisticated combination that, you know, nobody's going to complain about. I don't care what HOA you're in. Um, the showy daisy bloom, these will both tolerate um, a part shade situation. And in fact, I would recommend that with the columbine that you give it um, maybe like an eastern exposure so it doesn't get the afternoon sun. Uh, and the showy daisy can tolerate um, dappled shade like under, you know, a smaller tree. And these two look wonderful planted in combination with each other. And then, um, you know, something to consider, which, you know, a lot of people think, oh, you know, if you're talking water-wise planting, you know, you're only talking cactus. But, you know, cactus actually have some great horticulture potential that people, I think, overlook a lot. You can get these beautiful flowers in the middle of the summertime that are fantastic for pollinators. Um, and they come in a variety of different colors from yellows to oranges to pinks. And then, you know, they can get red fruit on them in the fall. And um, some of them even turn like this purplish color in the winter. They provide winter interest. And they're also so, uh, you know, ignition resistant that you could put these within the first th three to five feet of your house, as long as you, you know, aren't too worried about the um, spines and the glockets. So you, d you definitely want to be, you know, conscientious of those but they would be worthy of putting, you know, closer to your house. And then another species that, you know, I think gets, doesn't get anywhere near uh, the love it should is yucca. Um, I'm completely in love with yucca and they have this incredible architectural presence. They look great all year round. They have these beautiful spikes of flowers in the springtime, um, like usually in June and, um, and also are very, very ignition resistant. And so again, you could put these a little bit closer to the house if you don't need to walk right near them because the, the very spine tips are a little bit on the short, sharp side. And then, you know, some um, uh, ignition resistant perennials that aren't native, but they're still, you know, in that drought, drought tolerant um, category um, include things like hardy geraniums or rock rose, um, other lupins, Oriental poppy, Jupiter's beard, salvias, agastides, and spring bulbs. So those would be things that you could also um, plant without any problems. And then moving on to some shrubs. So again, we mentioned that ideally you won't have any shrubs within that first 30 feet, but if you have to have some, make sure that they're not continuous. Um, so a shrub patch should be less than 100 square feet within that first 30 feet feet, so, you know, should not be bigger than 10 by 10, and um, you shouldn't have any within that first 15 feet of your house. And so you can kind of think about using shrubs as more like a hedgerow, maybe 30 feet from your house if you've got that big of a property, and you can kind of consider it as, you know, maybe creating a privacy screen to replace any trees that you had to cut down. Um, <clears throat> and your shrubs should have a high water content. So, you know, things like lilacs or mock oranges are, you know, examples of higher water content shrubs. And shrubs that you should consider using with, a ca with caution would be Apache plume and mountain mahogany. And those are just because they tend to get a few little, um, you know, they have sort of plumose um, seed heads that may be slightly more prone to igniting. So some shrubs that would be within, um, that would I would recommend would be serviceberry. So this provides great habitat because it's got pollinator um, attracting flowers in the springtime. It has berries, which are edible for birds and very attractive to birds, but also edible for humans. And then it has a nice red fall color. Show cherry is one of the very, very best habitat plants that you can grow. It has, um, you know, fragrant white flowers in the springtime. It produces a glossy black berry, which is um, very attractive to birds and also to bears. Although if you are concerned about bears coming, they would only 
they would come, they would strip the choke cherries, but they wouldn't, you know, be a constant returner to your house. Unlike if you're putting out trash every day, they would learn to come back to your house um, on a continual basis, but they don't return to the choke cherry and become a problem. And then they also provide um, host, they're a host plant to a lot of different kinds of insects, which then provides food to the birds. They can become a pretty suckery plant. And so this is a great thing if you are trying to create a taller privacy hedge, and it can become a problem if you're trying to have just a shrub that, that doesn't sucker. Shrubby sinkfoil is a nice um, refined looking plant. It has lots of yellow flowers for a long season of bloom and attracts a variety of different pollinators. <clears throat> Golden currant is one of my favorites. It's blooming um, now, depending on where you are. The blooms attract hummingbirds in the springtime, and then you get uh, berries, which are edible for humans and for birds, and then it turns a beautiful red fall color. Um, so that, it, you know, it's another plant that you could plant, I don't care what HOA, um, it, they would never argue with you about a golden current. Boulder raspberry is another beautiful plant. It has large white flowers in the um, early, in the late spring, early summer, um, and they look like roses. It is in the rose family. It has, uh, you know, sort of a reddish bark that looks nice in this in the winter time. And it's a very tough plant here. As you can see, it's here, it is growing out um, on the rocks. Um, and then it also will bloom uh, in the shade. So it's a very short, shade, excuse me, shade tolerant shrub. And red twig dogwood, which is, um, it's, it will appreciate a little bit of extra water. And so this would be something, you know, that to plant, if you have a little bit of a uh, area that collects some extra water, um, or, you know, you have the ability to irrigate um, the red twig dogwood is a nice fire resistant, or I'm sorry, ignition resistant shrub, has white flowers in the spring, produces white berries that um, are attractive to birds. And then of course it has the beautiful red color, which, you know, is the classic winter interest plant. And a Cheyenne mock orange is a regional native, so it's not quite native to Colorado, but it is native to Idaho and further up. And it has beautiful white fragrant flowers um, in the early part of the summer. And it's, you know, just a fantastic shrub. This one I had, um, this was growing at my house, but I had it outside of my office when I was up in Gilpin County. Whenever it was in bloom, people would come in and be like, what is that shrub? I have to have it because it was just so delightfully fragrant. And then lilacs, which are not native, um, but they are, you know, they do have a high water content. And they don't tend to accumulate a lot of, um, you know, dead branches or anything. These also can make a great, um, a great tall, you know, water resistant shrub. And they are attractive to a lot of different um, bees and particularly butterflies. So, um, so if you do have somebody, you know, who, who doesn't want some of the other shrubs, this would be a good choice as well. All right, I think that is the end. So any other questions? Yes, we have uh, quite a few actually. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned one, uh, the boulder uh, raspberry, but uh, Smita asked, could you list some plains that do well in part shade and in parentheses she has only late afternoon sun? So yeah, so the boulder raspberry, a golden current would work well in that situation. Service berries. Are you just talking about shrubs or any plants? Uh, Smita, I'll ask you about that. If you could uh, come off mute and, and clarify. Well, she says any plants. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah. So the service berry, choke cherry. Um, a lot of the perennials that I discussed do best in um, in full sun, unfortunately. But some of the ones. Um, like the um, the prairie smoke would do well in part shade. Columbine would do well in part shade. In fact, actually your late afternoon sun, depending on how much sun, that might even still be a little bit too blasting for the columbine. Um, but yeah, a lot of the, you know, a lot of our perennials that are really good for attracting pollinators um, do better in a more full sun situation. 
Um, thank you. Uh, Dave Root asked, has there ever been an effort to encourage nurseries to promote Firewise plants in the same way they promote Xeric plants? Hmm. That's a, that would be a great effort. I am not aware of one, um, but yeah, that would be a pretty cool thing for them to do, but I'm, I'm not aware of any nurseries doing that. Competition, Dave, competition. You get the Firewise nursery in my vehicle itself, especially if you can make it look nice, like you're talking about, Irene, and if you had those uh, areas where you could, you know, present them in a in a fashion that would you know make folks uh want to buy it you, the pathways that you're showing would were uh, really attractive okay uh we have a a comment from becky um also uh similar to oh, there's one more message okay she says i have neighbors that feed deer corn so we have a very high deer population that makes uh, starting any plants difficult uh, they wipe out uh, my seedlings of Indian rice grass, penstemon, silver lupin, et cetera, even though I know the lupins are supposed to be okay. Um, yeah, I think that's, we yeah, all I have mean, different Well, <laughs> I mean, so for about, one thing, you know, well. for one thing, it's illegal to feed deer in Colorado. And so um, if there is any way to chat with your neighbors about that or to rat them out, even considering, you know, uh, I mean, you know, like, I don't think it would be, I mean, I think it's a serious enough issue that, you know, like ratting them out is not necessarily um, a terrible thing, particularly if you've already chatted with them first about it. Um, you know, so you could talk to Parks and Wildlife about it. Um, and maybe, you know, that would at least realize that the, the deer, you know, deer feeding is actually problematic. But then also, um, you know, so you might need to build like little cages around like the new plants. So it, the young plants tend to be the ones that are the most um, deer attractants. And so like, you know, doing, you know, creating like a little chicken wire cage or something like that, just to get things started. And then, you know, trees, if you, I mean, I live in a lot of deer area and, um, you know, we just put, you know, like the cages around the deer, the trees that you plant, because if you just plant a new tree, deer is going to eat it. And so, you know, so sometimes you just got to work. I mean, because a lot of the repellents, if you have a high deer pressure area, the, the repellents really just don't work. And you have to resort to physical things like, uh, you know, cages or, you know, it, ideally, um, uh, you know, a, a deer fence uh, would, would be a good idea, but that doesn't work in all situations. And I know some HOAs don't allow for, um, you know, fences. So it's not the world's Stephen most attractive. Has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, and I was just gonna say one other thing is like some you can sometimes buy some like wire, you know, just like chicken wire that's a little bit darker colored, so it's not as ugly looking. So it actually kind of blends into the landscape a little bit more. So <laughs> thank you for that. Stephen has a question. He starts out with a comment. I was told by a wildland firefighter that yucca hold embers and smolder making a real risk for delayed fire ignition even after days later after the fire has passed. So we've been removing them without um, removing them within 30 feet of the house. Uh, your thoughts? Well, that um, I guess I'd have to do a little bit more research on that. I think if you did have like a I, I could see how if you had a really intense, um, you know, fire that came through, that would be more of the sort of, you know, the wall of flames and not the embers. And that then, you know, and it got to be, you know, so intense that the roots would catch on fire, that there is a lot of stored um, carbohydrates in the, you know, in the deep root system. And so I could see how, um, you know, that could hold, uh, it, you know, might be able to, sort of hold fire in for a long time if you had that intense of a fire. But if you're just talking about like ignition resistant, uh, it's still it's it's still one of the less um, ignit it's least likely to actually ignite just simply from embers. So I guess maybe there's, you know, like a little bit of a um, 
I guess it depends on how, uh, you know, like if you did get to the, the fire that would, that would be really um, intensely hot, um, it, there could be some potential for that. So I think if you don't, if um, you're, I think it'd be fine to remove them within 30 feet of the house. I think you could also, you know, um, just keep them a little bit further out um, simply because I don't, they're not a, a plant that's, you know, um, going to promote a lot of um, spread. But I, I guess I'd have to do a little bit more research on that because I, um, because everything that I was reading was, you know, was really promoting it as a um, very ignition resistant plant, but I could see once it got started that it could hold. So anyway, I'm repeating myself, sorry. Hey, Andre. Oh, that's okay. Uh, yeah, this Dave. Dave, but you know, I have never heard of yucca being a fire hazard. I've never heard of them catching embers. Uh, that may be something new, but it, it strikes me as unlikely. And that's certainly all the research that I, I, think I had done. Done. I think we've seen or heard of situations where um, a material, either living or, you know, um, a building material that was resistant, the, uh, the fire was so hot that it exceeded any kind of protective parameters with it. So you give me a scenario, I can find a way to, to, to basically uh, overcome it. So um, I, like we've all been talking about all along, we're talking about risk reduction. And so um, this gives you a better option than others. And I think that's what Irene is trying to get over to us. There are no or very few perfect solutions, you know, to it. And I think we've heard Cherise talk about the difficulty um, in the, the perception of the, the folks that live there. Plus, you know, you're dealing with your environment and what it's like uh, there too. So. Yeah, uh, so I would just frame it in risk reduction terms. You know, you're trying to have the best, most beautiful appearing landscape and have the materials that reduce that risk uh, to your home and your area. Okay, folks, I'm gonna halt the recording here. Really, the, for the most part, the the remainder of the, the questions, um, there's Q&A uh, here for about a, 10 or 20 more minutes here, and we'll provide the recording to you uh, so you can listen to the entire thing if you'd like to uh, hear the other questions here. But I want to prov uh, provide a few more, or a little bit of time for us to be able to talk about, or to, for you to ask questions here that we may not have heard. So anything from the group or issues that you think you've seen that were contrary to what Irene mentioned? Okay, uh, if you if you weren't looking at the chat the entire time, uh, Lisa posted some items and so did I, and then also Kim Weeks posted uh, some publications also with a, a list. Thank you very much for uh, providing that information here for us. Uh, I, as you could see in in Irene's presentation that. Um, there are options, but there are no perfect solutions. So it all depends on your situation and what you're looking at here as to what works for you. Uh, there may be some elements that will, you know, fit your situation perfectly, but you may not necessarily like some of the options like you heard with uh, Cherise from Oregon. So um, just take a look, you know, be smart about it. Uh, the, the handouts do give you options. There are, if you go to the El Paso County Office of Emergency Management. There are different um, flyers that you can get from that on ignition resistant um, vegetation too, that, so that you could take a look. So you can bring those with you to uh, the nursery if you were, or do a little bit of research beforehand and see which ones look good to you and then bring those over to nurseries and see if you can get them. So. Uh, with that, I'd like to open it up for any questions or comments or anything from your end, Lisa, that you'd like to mention. I've already watched this video. This is the third year in a row I've watched this video, but I always learn something new from it. And now that we're at our new house, I'm just 
wishing I could do this stage of it, but we're still at the deconstruction phase right now. <laughs> Lisa's cutting a lot of stuff from our house right now. Oh, I have some stories that I won't tell you this tonight. Yep. <laughs> Okay, folks, uh, with that, I want to be respectful of your time, and I want to say thank you for being with us once again, and we have one more session next week, and we'll close out um, the program as uh, we've seen in terms of the academic portion here, and it's going to be with Robin Adair from the Heights Peak Regional Office of Emergency Management, and she is going to discuss uh, emergency or uh, what evacuation and emergency preparedness for us here. So uh, please come. We'll have a, a guest speaker. She will be live and it won't be <laughs> a recording this time here. So we'll have Robin. She's fantastic. She loves uh, questions and um, I, I think uh, she's a great asset for us. So please uh, come back. And then uh, next week we'll talk about the, the closeout and then looking uh, towards the summer. Oh, do we have, is there any homework this week, Andre? I forgot to even ask you that before. Nope, not for this week. So uh, if you still are working on homework elements, please, you know, keep doing that. Lisa and I are going to start looking at the composite list of homework as we've gone here to, to look at our, our three neighborhoods here. So um, don't, don't feel that if you're behind that that's uh, an issue. Just keep plugging away and then let us know. The more the most important thing is that you're making progress here and there's a, a benefit to doing that. So um, with that, we'll be see you next Tuesday and hope you have a great week and you're all clear to drop. Take care. Thanks, Andre. Thanks, sir.